So now let's take a look at the pharmacological management of allergic rhinitis and asthma. So the AREA guideline, which is the Allergic Rhinitis and its Impact on Asthma guideline, in collaboration with the World Health Organization, created a new classification system in 2019, which wasn't based on the allergen trigger, but instead based on the frequency and severity of symptoms, and it considered the functional ability of the patient as well. And this seems to be a much more effective tool at making treatment decisions. So you can see the symptoms can be intermittent or persistent and mild or moderate to severe. So before we look at the specific drugs themselves, I'm just gonna briefly run through the immunology of allergic rhinitis um, to understand why we're using specific drugs. So when you think about the immunology of um, an allergy, there's two phases. Um, initially, primary sensitization, and then there's re-exposure to the allergen. So if the allergen is grass pollen, in this case, the patient is first exposed to grass pollen, and um, this is taken up by an antigen-presenting cell or dendritic cell. It's chewed up, basically, into small fragments or, or peptides, and these peptides are then presented to naive T cells, which then transform to Th2 cells and secrete cytokine, so the cytokines IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. And these act on the B plasma cell to activate it and allow it to produce specific grass pollen IgE antibodies. Now these antibodies then move into the lymphatics and into the bloodstream and they attach to the outside of effector cells which are the mast cells or basophils. At this point the patient has developed no symptoms but their system is primed, it's primed and ready for re-exposure. And so when the patient is exposed again to grass pollen, this time round, the grass pollen, that allergen, attaches to the antibodies on the outside of the mast cell, for example, and causes the mast cell to become activated and degranulate. And inside the mast cell, you have all of these inflammatory chemicals which are then released. And these inflammatory chemicals include histamine and leukotriones. So when you think of these inflammatory chemicals and the symptoms that they cause, histamine can cause sneezing and itching um, and can have some impact on rhinorrhea and nasal blockage. Whereas leukotrienes have more of an impact on rhinorrhea and nasal blockage and prostaglandins and kinins more nasal blockage uh, rather than rhinorrhea. And then when you think about the different drugs that we use to treat allergic rhinitis, we use antihistamines, we use anti re receptors, and we also use uh, mast cell stabilizers. So now if we look at um, the different drugs and what they're most frequently used for and what they're most effective for, you can see this table here, which obviously th there's a lot on it, but um, you can see that antihistamines are particularly effective for sneezing, rhinorrhea, nasal itching and eye symptoms, whereas leukotrienes and intranasal corticosteroids are generally uh, very effective really for all of these symptoms, including nasal blockage. Decongestants are effective for nasal blockage alone and not for the other symptoms. Mild intermittent allergic rhinitis can initially, if it's, if it's very intermittent, can initially be treated by oral or nasal decongestants just purely as a rescue medication. So this causes vasoconstriction and therefore reduces nasal congestion and blockage. It's important that patients are aware that you use these for no longer than five days because um, if they're overused, they can result in rhinitis medicomentosa. And um, so it's very important to educate your patients about this and make sure not to use it under the age of six and not to use during pregnancy or breastfeeding. Antihistamines, so H1 antihistamines, block the physiological effect from mast cell derived histamine. Um, second generation are preferred, they're less cholinergic and they're less sed um, sedating side effects. So over the counter these would include things like cetirizine or loratadine and then on prescription the higher dose of fexofenadine um, and velastine. And you've also got topical antihistamines as well. And antihistamines in general for mild intermittent allergic rhinitis can be taken either as needed or on a regular daily basis. So as for moderate to severe intermittent and persistent allergic rhinitis, the first line treatment is an intranasal corticosteroid and this is a twice daily spray to each nostril and it's good to ensure that there is appropriate technique as well. Ideally you want an intranasal corticosteroid spray that has a low bioavailability and the reason being that you don't want the systemic side effects of 
corticosteroid where possible. And if the nasal cavity is very obstructed, occasionally a topical steroid drop needs to be used to allow a nasal spray to be effective. If this isn't sufficient, then a combination intranasal treatment can be used. So this is an intranasal steroid and antihistamine. And again, it's a twice daily spray and suitable for over 12s. In addition to these, if the patient has asthma or lower airway irritability, a leukotriene receptor antagonist like Monte Lucas can be considered. Oral steroids are rarely used, um, although they are used uh, for asthma flare-ups. And in the past, IM, intramuscular steroids, were occasionally used pre hay fever season, but are not advised now. And the reason being that um, we don't want patients to experience the side, effect, um, side effects of steroids, such as the image there. As regards eye symptoms, oral antihistamines are often more than effective. Otherwise, topical antihistamines, topical chromones or mast cell stabilizers, and topical decongestant and antihistamine combination can be used. Topical steroids, again, are rarely used and you would want specialist and um, ophthalmologist involvement um, in these cases. So as for asthma management, it's essential that all asthma sufferers carry a reliever or um, short-acting beta agonist, particularly during pollen season. For those patients who suffer with infrequent asthma symptoms, intermittent use of a combination low-dose intercort um, inhaled corticosteroid or long-acting beta agonist can be used, such as formoterol. If their symptoms are present most days, a regular preventer and um, combination inhaler can be used um, and is probably uh, much more effective. As the symptoms increase in severity and frequency, the inhaler dose may need to be increased to moderate or even high dose and occasionally short courses of oral steroids are necessary and even additional medications um, such as Monte Lucas can be added. What's most appropriate for these patients is that we have an asthma action plan. And so when their symptoms are controlled and they're not flaring up, they know what to do. If they do start to experience a flare up, what an um, increase in medications they need to make. But more importantly, if they do start to experience an asthma attack, that they know exactly what they need to do. So essentially, if a patient comes into you, um, into your pharmacy and has um, the symptoms of a possible asthma attack, it's important that you sit them down and make sure they're not lying flat, that they're sitting upright and taking slow breaths in and out. Um, they need to use their short acting beta agonist, so their salbutamol inhaler, ideally with a spacer where possible. If they're over the age of six, Every minute for 10 minutes, you're going to give a puff of the salbutamol inhaler. If they're under six, you'll do six puffs over a 10 minute period. If their symptoms haven't resolved, then you'll call an ambulance immediately. Um, you may have already called an ambulance if you feel that that urgency is needed even before you start giving them the inhaler. If the ambulance hasn't arrived after 10 minutes, you'll again recommence giving those puffs um, as you've done before. As for additional management, we now have immunotherapy. This is where we give a minuscule amount of what the patient is allergic to, for example, grass pollen, and um, to try and encourage their immune system to build tolerance. So it's like a vaccination. There's sublingual um, immunotherapy and subcutaneous immunotherapy, but we favor sublingual immunotherapy in Ireland. And we have immunotherapy for grass pollen, tree pollen, and dust mite. Generally, you're looking at at least three years of treatment and compliance is crucial throughout that time. And it's suitable from age six and up. The contraindications are severe or uncontrolled asthma, a severe fish allergy, and any systemic immunological disease or cancer. Um, there are some local side effects when you start taking the medication. Um, severe reactions and anaphylaxis thankfully are very rare, but the initial dose does need to be given under medical supervision. In addition to this, the GINA guidelines, uh, which is the Global Initiative for Asthma, in 2020 for the first time has added dust mite um, sublingual immunotherapy um, as part of a possible management plan for patients. Endonasal phototherapy. So phototherapy is well established for the treatment of skin conditions like psoriasis, but now this treatment can be used into the nasal cavity also. So rhinolite consists of UVA mainly um, and visible light um, alongside a very small amount of UVB. 
It has an, um, an immunosuppressive effect within the nasal cavity where it inhibits the allergen induced histamine released from the mast cells and it also induces apoptosis in the T lymphocytes and eosinophils and it's well tolerated and it's effective. It's particularly um, effective for patients where pharmacological treatment is insufficient or contraindicated. And finally, surgical intervention. So um, generally, we would say allergic rhinitis is a medical condition and it needs medical management. However, if the patient has a unilateral symptoms, they may actually have a septal deviation or polyps or indeed a tumor. And um, so in those situations, it's important to have a surgical opinion.